this is for Terence Duarte. <laughs> Not this slide, the next slide. Okay. Um, so, vertebral column. You have ligaments that don't stretch, and then ligaments that do stretch in the areas where you want a lot of movement. So, anteriorly, where the bodies are only semi-movable, then you're going to have a ligament that won't stretch, so that it's going to help to keep those vertebrae from moving off of each other. So, we're running anteriorly and longitudinally up to down, you have an anterior longitudinal ligament. On the back side of the vertebral body, running longitudinally, is going to be a posterior longitudinal ligament. So anteriorly and posteriorly on the vertebral body, you have non-stretchable ligaments to keep the vertebral bodies aligned for weight-bearing purposes. And then between your spinous processes, you're going to have the ligaments, but and then also a spine a ligament right on top of the spinous process. So inter between spinous ligaments. So spinous is referring now to the spinous process, and then supra on top of the spinous process, supraspinous ligament. That supraspinous ligament, when it crosses the cervical region, becomes the ligamentum nuchi, which is a lactan elastic ligament. So you get a lot of stretch back there. It also is there before the spinous processes of the vertebrae are formed. They form around that ligament and then get a bifid structure, a fork structure. Ligamentum flavum is also an elastic ligament. It's running on the inside of the vertebral canal. So where you're freely movable, you also have this internal elastic ligament that helps to give the the rebound when your head falls over when you're falling asleep and your head bounces up, that's the elastic ligament gets stretched. So we've talked about annulus fibrosis, nucleus propulsus. These the nucleus propulsus is that remnant of your notochord. Annulus fibrosis is your fibrous car fibrocartilage that forms the majority of the disc. The fibrocartilage is fusing the vertebral bodies together, so you're not getting very much movement, it's just slightly movable at that point. So next slide, we have a complete fracture, complete dislocation of the cervical spine. Here is C7. And here, halfway up, C6 is, sorry, this is C6. Halfway up, C6 is C7. This is a lateral view, lateral x-ray of the lower cervical spine. So what is your first reaction to this? Is this guy going to be moving around? Is he going to be a quadriplegic? Yeah. That's what most people say. Okay, so let's look at his history. He's a male, 59 years old, involved in MBA. What's that? All right, some people know their shorthand. Okay, motor vehicle accident. His chief complaint is neck pain. No chief complaint about, I can't move from my neck down. All he says is, I got some neck pain. Physical exam, cervical muscle spasm is there, but, and he's got contusions on his forehead, face, extremities. His speech is clear, cranial nerves are intact, that means everything up here is working fine. 
He has minimal right tricep weakness, so that means triceps are working, so he's not a quadriplegic. And he's got um, decreased reflexes everywhere else, slight decreased um, weakness and decreased reflexes, but no sensory deficit. So he's feeling everything everywhere. So, not a quadriplegic, how the heck did that happen? He sh it looks like he should be a quadriplegic. Looks like his whole spinal co um, cord should be severed by this dislocation. So, this is what the C6 vertebrate looks like. So, it did that regular x-ray laterally and saw this and went, Ooh. But doesn't match up with his symptoms. So what the heck's going on? Send him back for the CT scan and then look at the individual vertebra. Get to C6 and you see that it's pretty damaged. The pedestal connection between the vertebral body and the vertebral arch, totally blown out on this side. So there's big space here, fragments out here in the tissue. Looks like this side is fractured somewhat too. You've got a, a lateral displacement of the, the vertebral arch and the spinous process kind of tilted over to the side. So there's a fracture here, fracture here, bilateral pedestal fracture. The fact that there's a lateral displacement of the vertebral arch means there's more space for the spinal cord. This is what saved him. There, they, the fractures and the movement of the vertebral arch decompressed the spinal cord, so it didn't get severed. The other thing is that <coughs> the, the spinal cord, sorry, the spinal cord could then move out of the vertebral canal when C7 went up halfway up C6. So the cord displaced and went with C7 and didn't get a fracture. So of course with this displacement, the muscles are pretty darn irritated there and they're going into spasm, partly because of the trauma and partly because they're going, oh my God, they've got to stabilize this, whatever's going on there. When, when Joints become unstable, muscles tend to spasm to want to try and hold them in the right shape. Okay, so next slide. What they tried to figure out what exactly could have caused this type of injury. So they looked at the contusions on his face, forehead, face all banged up. He had gone downhill into a ravine and his car had smashed into the bottom of the ravine. He came forward, hit the steering wheel with his head. The head went back really fast, severe hyperextension. What that did was rupture that anterior longitudinal ligament. So this ruptured and that also decompressed the spinal cord. And then the, the intervertebral discs separated because now they don't have their anterior stability anymore. That fracture of C6 was actually what saved his life because had C7 come out of position without those fractures, then he would have had his cord severed. And he might have been a quadriplegic, he might have died from internal bleeding in that case. So the fractures of C6 were what saved his life. Okay, you are now the hospital staff. What the hell are you gonna do for this guy? Are you gonna, he's, he's got minimal damage. He's functioning fine with some minor weakness and reflex damage. Are you going to try and put C7 back in place? Well, but if you don't do it, what happens if he gets another like trauma on his neck? Yeah. Yeah. 
You're going to stabilize this guy with C7 halfway up C6? I mean, yeah, it's an absurdity. Okay, so some people are saying, let's turn him to surgery. <laughs> some people are saying, let's, let's stabilize him. <laughs> Anybody just going to send him home and let him fend for himself? <laughs> What's, okay, the one that calms, what's the main one that calms nerves again? Would you want to put this guy into traction? Calming, calming effect on nerves. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cervical collar does minimal of that. All it does is really hold the neck in position. So, no. Cervical collar is not traction. Cervical traction, you put this contraption around their head and then you put weights sometimes up over a door or you have them lie flat and then you put weights hanging over a table and you slowly stretch the head up and decompress the vertebrae and hope C7 moves back to where it's supposed to be. Okay, what's the drawback to traction? And the anterior is not there, so... It could make it worse. It could decompress it. You could definitely make this worse because what if the vertebrae severs the cord when it's going back in? Okay. <laughs> but if you send him to surgery and the surgeon cuts something that he's not supposed to cut, and actually to get to the vertebrae that's fractured and get to the vertebrae that's displaced, He's going to have to go through tissues that have nerves in it, so he's going to be cutting something that's important. What about the kind that's like non, not too intrusive? Are you trying to intrusive? Well, no, well, it's, it's the, the microsurgery technique's not going to work for this. <laughs> for stenosis, maybe. <laughs> not for this. What if MRI is only going to show up soft tissue damage? You, you got a good idea of what the problem is. You can infer what the soft tissue damage is based on what the bone damage is. Okay, so every year I take a vote. Who's going to do surgery on this guy? I'm going to do both. Okay, both at the same time. Ooh, you really bad. <laughs> 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 Don't become my surgeon. <laughs> but what would be uh, what would happen if we just sent him home to just for himself? Would he just continue to have what if he <coughs> what if he sneezed? <laughs> <laughs> what if what if there was a loud noise and his reflexes said turn my head? <laughs> Not a good idea to send him home and fend for himself. Okay, I'm letting you guys, you're the doctors. Okay. That's surgery. That entering anteriorly, it's a little safer than entering posteriorly. <laughs> this is one case acupuncture is not going to help. Okay. Could you maybe just put in like rods? He just so he'll never be able to turn, but he'll. <laughs> I mean, like he'll never, he'll never have any trauma. Like it would just hold it in place of anything that like moves it. You you could do that, and they will put rods in if the spinal column is is becoming unstable and you say he had scoliosis and it gets beyond I think 50 degrees or something like that, then they'll, they'll actually go in and put rods outside. But I wouldn't think any any surgeon <laughs> would go in and, and put rods to stabilize C7 out of the No, he definitely needs to. He needs to vote put back in place so everything all fractured back. And then if <laughs> okay, you're voting for surgery. Okay, so who's voting for surgery? Okay, so five, five people, six people, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Who's voting for traction? Okay, I want the people who vote for traction, my doctor. <laughs> it's scary. It really is scary. And these guys, these doctors said, you know, 
We could make him worse by doing traction, but we're probably definitely going to make him worse by surgery. So let's do the minimally invasive thing, which is traction. And so they did it. Of course, you do it progressively, so you don't just try and decompress him all at once. You do it slowly. And that's what they did. They decompressed him. The cervical vertebra, sorry, I don't have that slide. So the C7 went back into place. And over time, the irritated fibroblasts, which are really pretty irritated at this time, start to form scar tissue there. They're probably going to lose movement between C6 and C7 due to the scar tissue formation. But the bone fragments that were there, these small ones will get reabsorbed. The bigger pieces will knit together. You might still have a distortion here. It depends if that traction moves things back and then you ossify it in the right position. But he got the traction work. He got his vertebrae back in position with no further damage done. And everything was stable within about, I think, six to seven months, something like that. What about the ligaments, the anterior ligaments? The anterior longitudinal ligament scar tissue is going to form and reinforce that. Yeah. So maybe, well, it's not a very movable area anyway, so it really doesn't matter what. Um, if the ligament's not going to reform nicely, but scar tissue will reinforce it and it'll be kind, kind of like a ligament again. Okay. So here we have a sternal clavicular joint, so maneuvering of the sternum and your clavicle. That joint here is just <coughs> like the temporomandibular joint. It has an interarticular disc. So you've got joint space on the maneuvering side, joint space on the clavicle side with a fibrous disc in between. It's not shown here. I'm not sure why the artist failed to draw it in but they're interarticular disc, and then you have these sternoclavicular ligaments, and of course a joint capsule that will stabilize that joint. If this joint is dislocated, are you going to do surgery to correct that? Who says yes? Who says no? You're gonna do traction. <laughs> Okay, now you're on the traction team. <laughs> um, actually, because of that intraarticular disc, once that joint is dislocated, there's really not much they can do now for that joint. That's why you don't want to wear out TMJ, temporomandibular joint, <coughs> because there's not much you can do to resurface that joint. You can't get the fibrous disc back, can't get the fibrous disc back <coughs> here, so generally, do nothing. Just uh, leave it like that. And rely on the muscles to give your pectoral girdle stability. So when you see somebody who has a normal bump here and then a bigger bump here, and when the shoulder is moving, the clavicles are really go in all different directions. They've probably somehow, probably with a fall, dislocated that sternoclavicular joint. You've got muscles like subclavius, you've got ligaments like the costoclavicular ligament that aren't damaged with the injury. You've also got pectoralis minor, you've got pectoralis major, you've got all the muscles on the back that will help to stabilize the pectoral girdle. So generally they don't do anything. Maybe some of you guys will figure out how to fix TMJ and how to fix these joints that have these intraarticular ligaments. So we talked about bursa. Here in the shoulder joint, that's a very common place for bursitis to occur. You're going to be going into medicine, you're going to be a physical therapist, you're going to be working with a lot of older people who have muscle weakness and therefore have a lot of shoulder pain due to bursitis there. The muscles, this is a very movable joint with freely move, free movement comes very unstable joint surfaces. 
When the muscles get weak and can't stabilize the joint, then you get pressure on the bursa. The bursa are there between bone, um, bones that are moving over bones. And they, when the muscles are not stabilizing the interaction of the bones in the joint, then the bursa gets squished and becomes inflamed and then it's painful. So bursitis gets to be chronic because if you, if you try and exercise the muscles to get the joint stability back, you don't do it carefully enough, you irritate the bursa more and inflame the bursitis. When it hurts a lot, you don't want to move. When you don't move, the muscles get weak. And then when the, mus when the pain goes away and you try too aggressively to strengthen the muscles, you get the flare-up of the bursitis again. So please realize old folks are not like young folks. If you if you're doing an intake, always ask them if they have had bursitis at any time, even if it's not flared up now. If you hand an 80-year-old 5-pound, 10-pound dumbbell and tell them to do chest flies and shoulder flexion and abduction, you're going to set off that bursitis so fast, it's like you blink and they're already complaining already. So you've got to start out with like quarter pound, Maybe even that's too much. Send them to aqua therapy and have them use the water resistance to build up strength and then get to weight, weight exercise. But one experience I had where I should have kept my mouth shut in the weight room but couldn't because I work with older people and here's this, this trainer person with an 80 year old woman on a bench, she hands her five pound weights and tells her to do chest flies. No instruction in how to do chest flies, and the ladies all over the place with the dumbbells. And she can't, she gets them down, but then she just drops them. She says, I think that flared up my bursitis. <laughs> like, what? You didn't even know she had bursitis. She handed her five pound weights. Should have kept my mouth shut because I got in trouble, but and I, just, I couldn't help it. It was just, totally inappropriate that she had, she shouldn't be a trainer. She wasn't a trainer, she had some kind of online certification for something. <laughs> she had 17 of them though. Uh, yeah, so highly qualified. <laughs> okay, so all these bursa all over the place, they're trying to keep the bones from running into each other, but if the muscles can't stabilize the bones, then they, the bursa will become the plane, bottom line. So they're all over the place. You also have similar structures called tendon sheaths. They're really synovial fluid membranes that are surrounding the tendon. The tendons are running through the synovial membrane and being lubricated by the synovial fluid. So tendon sheets, if they become inflamed, then tendonitis. So tendonitis and bursitis, shoulder is very common. Look at the surface area on the glenoid cavity. It's very small. Compare it with the head of the, the humerus. Go back to your chapter seven and look at that. The surface is extended a little bit by a fibrous cartilage ring called the glenoid labrum, but not so much. And that's what gives you this very movable shoulder. What's labeled glenohumeral ligaments is essentially the joint capsule. It's not really there for any stability. Ligament implies it's stable. But when the shoulder is down in anatomical position, you see the ligaments are already folded. That means they are much broader than what they appear to be. That gives you this very flexible shoulder. But the fact that the ligaments aren't structurally um, limiting the movement of the shoulder means that there's not much stability um, contributed to the shoulder by that glenohumeral ligament. The biceps brachii tendon is 
a stabilizing force, and then you have your um, coracohumeral ligaments, and you have a chromial, um, somewhere a chromiohumeral ligament, and I'm not seeing it right off the bat. So there are some, and then it's mostly muscle that's stabilizing the shoulder, and there are some bones coming from the scapula to the humerus, and then from the clavicle to the humerus. Okay, so, supraspinatus muscle, you have teres minor and subscapularis, and infraspinatus, those will all, all have tendons that cross the shoulder and contribute to the stability of the shoulder. The articular capsule is hanging in a fold down when the arm is down at your side. The actual surface area for the humerus on the gleno, on the, in the glenoid cavity is about half, less than half of the whole articular surface of the shoulder. Synovial membranes out here, and that's about it for the shoulder. <clears throat> okay, we'll pick up with the elbow 